And in the conversation between the day angel and Mary, Mary is given a second shock, by the way. Now, when talking to Mary, the angel gives her a shock. He says, do you know your cousin Elizabeth who was childless? She's now six months pregnant. I can't tell you how big a shock this must have come to Mary, which means the first person, think about it, the first person who told Mary that Elizabeth was pregnant was the angel. Remember your relative Elizabeth? It is said she cannot have children. She herself is now six months pregnant, even though she's very old. Elizabeth and Mary were very close. And when a person who's close chooses not to tell you certain things, how hurt do you get? Okay, granted, a woman, once she conceives, she doesn't go on the roads and start proclaiming, I've conceived, I've conceived. But after one, two months, okay, they release the news. They tell the others, I'm expecting a child. Elizabeth, six months! And she did not tell, the angel told. Can you imagine what Mary must have felt? You know, Elizabeth and her husband were very pious people, but somehow the Lord had not blessed them with children. It was a very, very matter. It was a matter of shame for Elizabeth. How do I know that? Because the scripture says the first thing she said after she conceived was, she said, at last the Lord has taken away my public disgrace. At last, the Lord has taken away my public disgrace, which means for her, childlessness was a disgrace. People used to laugh at them, you understand? People used to make fun of them, even relatives, except one relative, Mary. Mary always was supportive, always with her. And finally, now what happens? She has conceived and she has not told Mary and Mary comes to know through about it through the angel, how hurt she must have been. Now, translate it into your life. Some close relative, say, gets married. They come straight away with the card your house. You're shocked. You are not even told. The family and their family never even told you that they're close to marriage. What would you feel? What would be your reaction? Huh? You would say thank you and receive the card, I suppose. And after they went, you and your wife would sit and say, okay, they have not told us. So we will we'll go only for the nuptials. We won't go for the reception. Wouldn't we say that? Let's be frank. Maybe some relative has gone abroad. Huh? Three, four months after the person has reached abroad, they tell you, oh, he's gone abroad. Oh, we didn't, we, they give some excuse for not telling you, or they don't give an excuse. How hurt are you? If you want to examine the inner shell of your heart and how much of that white stuff of unforgiveness is still there, walk with Mary and see how she reacted. For we are told that Mary reacted in this way soon afterwards. Look at those two words. Soon afterwards, Mary got ready and hurried off to the town in the hill country of Judea. She went into Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. Now Mary could have said that, okay, now well, fine. She has not told me, the angel has told me. I will pretend also that I don't know about it. She could have done that. We do it. But look at that and see the first two words. Soon afterwards, she did not postpone it. She went to serve the very person who had chosen not to reveal to her. She went to serve her. We know Elizabeth was six months pregnant and the scripture says that Mary waited for three months. Six plus three is nine months, which means you are you and I are to infer that till John the Baptist was born, Mary was at a house doing all the dirty work. If those of you all who have gone to Israel will see Elizabeth's house was at the top of the cliff and the nearest well was right down. And Mary, can you imagine her carrying up the water every day? carrying up the water, doing the cooking, doing the cleaning, doing everything in the house. For whom? For a person who had hidden this fact from her, who had not even told her about it. Have you pondered about this? Have you walked with Mary these steps and seen what she went through? But look at her reaction. She immediately went. If I was in Mary's place, I think I ponder what I would have done. Either number one, I would have said, okay, I pretend I also don't know about it. Or I say, okay, since I'm in the renewal, I'll go, but I won't go immediately. I'll go after some time. No hurry. And by the way, the road between uh, Nazareth and uh, uh, where Elizabeth's house is, there's no road. It's a jungle area. At that time it was, it was dangerous for a woman to travel there. It would take a journey of at least three days. And why take all this trouble for a person who has not even bothered to tell me? But look at Mary's reaction. If you want to learn forgiveness, look at Mary. She rushed to serve the very person who had hurt her and disappointed her. If I was in Mary's place, I would have said, well, 
uh, yeah, I would have come to help, you know, but now I have conceived. And by the way, my child is greater than yours, so I cannot come. I have to look after him. But she did not think of her interests. And as you know, most of you all know, that in the first three months, a woman who is caring is very delicate stage. She cannot do any hard work. But Mary, without thought to herself, hey, look at that man, without thought to herself, just went through those jungles. She went to the highlands of Judea, to Elizabeth's house. Three months she spent there doing all the work. Now see how it translates in your life. Have you reached out to the persons who have hurt you like this? Have you delayed? Have you pretended? Have you helped? But half-heartedly? Is your unforgiveness not complete? Do you wait to strike back at that person? Or if the person asks too much of you, remember this person did not tell me and now he's asking me for this or that. Come on, wherever you are in whichever land, we have the same heart. And sometimes the heart is filled with bitterness like this. Let's go further. Three months later, John the Baptist is born and there is a big dispute in the family. Luke's Gospel says they were almost quarreling in the house about what name to put him. The, the relatives were of the overwhelming view that they should name him Zechariah because his father's name was Zechariah. But the mother said, no, he should be John. The father also was told, as you know the story, the angel had told the father that he should be named John and then the father was struck dumb until it happened. So there was a quarrel between and the angels and the relatives were saying, no, uh, they, you don't have any relative by that name. And it was going on. Now my question is this. Why did they not bother to even ask Mary? Why is there no mention that that person in the kitchen who was doing all the hard work, who was doing all the dirty work, Mary, what do you feel should be the name? None of them, if you go by scripture, none of them seem to have asked her, what is your opinion? Has it happened to you in your life also? When people should have asked your opinion, you expected them at least to behave like that. Is it wrong, brother, for me to have this expectation? After doing so much for that person, that person should have at least asked me or told me or consulted me, but did not even bother. Can you hear now the Holy Spirit speaking to you wherever you are? Can you see him showing you the shell of your heart and where these hidden hurts are stuck? Then look at Mary. Just quiet. That's her work. Not bothered to be consulted. Okay, fine. But look at us. Especially people whom we have helped. Maybe I helped that person and now he is what he is and he doesn't bother to look at us. Huh? Can you see that? And then you go further in Mary's life. And you see it is the time for her delivery. She's in Nazareth. It's the ninth month. Jesus is about to be born. And Jesus was all set to be born, it appears, in Nazareth. But see how the Lord changed it. At the last minute, he gave Emperor Augustus a dream. And Augustus got up one morning and he said, let us have a census. We are told in the scripture, in Luke chapter 2, it was the first census ever held. Augustus thought it was his achievement, something he had dreamt of, unique. No one had thought about it. But little did he know, heaven had already decided that. Because heaven had to change course. Somehow the son of God had to be born in Bethlehem. And in the ninth month he was in Nazareth. So heaven simply put into the mind of Augustus when he woke up that morning. Have a census. And so he said, okay, let's have a census. Each one go to your own place. And imagine and picture the scene today. A proclamation is issued. And Joseph comes home to Mary and tells her, Mary, Mary, we have to go. We have to leave for Bethlehem. Bethlehem? Now? Yes, Mary. The emperor has ordered a census. We have to leave, Mary. And she accepts that. And she, you know, there were no cars that time, much less a plane or a train. So the only way of traveling was on a donkey. Can you picture a woman of nine months is carrying a child, nine months on the verge of delivery. Do you know what her journey by donkey would be like for so many days? Back and forth and back and forth. And during that time, undoubtedly this thing must have come into her mind. 
Why did the emperor have to think of this thing at this time only? Couldn't there have been a better time? It is easy at that moment for even anger and even curses to come from our mouth. Don't they come out when the government takes unfavorable decision against us? Suddenly increases the taxes. Suddenly does other, some other step. And it hurts us. What happens? And anger builds up against, against that authority, against that official, against the government. Why did they do that? Do you know that could have come easily in Mary's heart too? With every jerk up and down, up and down in the donkey, on the donkey. Can you imagine how uncomfortable that I was preaching a, a, at a convention and I'd explain this to the crowd. And in the crowd there was a man. I, he had, suddenly his mind was opened and the Holy Spirit reminded him of how his company had reduced the retirement age overnight from 60 to 57 because of which he was out of his job and that he had tremendous anger but he had never confessed it nor did he, did he realize that it is hidden in the shell of his heart there and there as the preaching was going on, going on he asked God for forgiveness and he forgave them it was a three day convention do you know before the third day he who was suffering from skin ailments of many years that skin ailment was taken away and he was healed. You understand what I'm saying to you? We think that forgiveness means only big guys who have done something to us, we have to forgive them. No. Even, you cannot receive the pure love of God unless you scrape out the coconut shell of your heart completely. Completely, leaving, leaving no white stuff. Then it can receive the pure love of Jesus. Listen to this, you cannot mix the pure milk of God's love as long as there's vinegar in the, in the heart. You have to drain the heart of vinegar. And for this, you need the Holy Spirit's help. You need to ponder. If I, the best thing you can do on, an, on a day like this is even the night, once you go home, ponder with these, some of these aspects. And may the Holy Spirit lead you to going back into Scripture, reading it, and opening your own life to yourself. And then you realize which mala, which mountain I'm stuck in, and why I cannot totally receive the love of God and reflect it on others. Why can I not love that person that much? It's all there. The Holy Spirit is there to help us. So we may be working for the Lord, we may be activists, we may be regular prayer comers, but we, are, we feel a vacuum within. You understand? We don't have to. God wants us to empty the vinegar completely so that the pure milk of his love may enter because vinegar and milk don't make a good combination. Now further, Mary and Joseph reach Bethlehem. You know that scene. But I want to explain it to you in a different way. A bride, when she goes for the first time to her husband's house, recall if you are married, the first time you went to your husband's house, you were completely nervous. Yours may have been a love marriage, but you know, the question remains, how will they treat me? Will they treat me well? Will all the family members accept me? You know, the husband doesn't have to make much change because he's in the same house. But the others, the wife has the, the bride has the worst part. She has butterflies in her stomach. Mary was going to Joseph's home, hometown, first time. What happened there? Picture it. They reached there. Joseph knocks the first door. They open it. And they say, Hi, Joseph, how are you? Joseph says, I'm well. But you know, uh, could I have a little room, a little place, even a corner in your house? You know, I have a wife. Uh, look there, she's on the she's on the donkey. She's expecting any time she may deliver. Please, some little corner you could give me. And picture the man saying, Oh, Joseph, I am really with you. I sympathize with you. But... Uh, uh, we can't help it, you know. You'll have to search somewhere else. And the door closes. Can you imagine the impact that on that woman who is sitting on the donkey when the first door closes? She comes to her husband's house. One door is closed. The next door jo Joseph knocks on. The person opens it with a smiling face and all that. But when Joseph makes his request, says, sorry, man, I can't do that. But I'll do one thing, Joseph. I'll pray for you. I will pray for you that you get place, but you'll have to go elsewhere and the door closes. Can you imagine the impact on her heart? 
think in your life when you were married, how many doors were close to you? How many people closed the doors of their heart when you came to your husband's house? Among the relatives, among the people who you thought would accept you well. And today you're okay, you're living with them, you're adjusting. But do you realize that it still remains in the shell of your heart? Do you realize that God wants you to bring it to him and recall it and he takes it all away? So that that area can be filled in a way that you can love them fully without condition. And finally, you know, Mary and Joseph got no place at all. And then they went and she gave birth in a manger. Uh, Mary must have laughed to herself in irony. Uh, my son is the king of the universe and he's the son of God. And my goodness me. He has to be born here. She could have become a very bitter person, but she did not. She just accepted it. That was the secret of Mary. She knew in the background of all these questions that came to her in her life, God has done it for her good. She cannot understand it now. I cannot understand now why I'm not getting a marriage partner, but I know it is for my best. The Lord will show me later. I really cannot understand why the Lord has not blessed me with the child now. But I know my God is a good God. He will show it and reveal it to me at the right time. I cannot understand why such children have been given to me who don't care for me, who just don't listen to me, but I accept it. See? And I keep pondering on it. And the Lord will show me one day why it had to happen, why it, had, it has been turned to my good. That was the pondering of Mary. And if Mary was bitter, or if Mary was unforgiving, the first proof of that would be Jesus would be unforgiving. Because as you know, Jesus was in her womb, and whatever the mother feels, who goes to the child, to the umbilical cord. Just now, a little while ago, you saw that when Elizabeth jumped with joy on seeing Mary at her house, the child within her womb, John the Baptist, also jumped. So such is the bond between the mother and child. But you don't find Jesus unforgiving. You don't find that. Because Mary was not. Later at Cana, Mary would say, do as he tells you. Why could she say this? Because she did as he told her. While he was in her. Can you, can you understand now the fullness of the sentence? Hail Mary, full of grace. You know, grace came through Jesus Christ. You're full of the nature of Jesus. So before she could tell others, do what he tells you, she knew the wisdom of it well. She learned it herself. She had done what he wanted her to do. She was filled with the fullness of, of Jesus. No? It's not just a one-time experience. Jesus remained with her throughout. You know that a woman cannot give birth unless there are two stages. She conceives. Number two stage, she has to retain what she has conceived. Otherwise, there's a miscarriage. She doesn't deliver. So, first is conception, then she has to retain. So it is with Jesus. Jesus is conceived in us. Someday when we discover the calling, when we discover, say through a retreat or other things, you meet him in a personal encounter. Wonderful. He's conceived within you. But then he must, you must, he must remain in you. He must grow in you. And through that you will find how grace operates, how the Lord teaches you, so that you in, and I in time can tell others what she said. Okay, you better do what he tells you to do. Okay, let's go on to our story. So we went, they went to the temple. Mary and Joseph went to the temple to offer a pair of doves. According to the law, Leviticus said, once you have the first son, you have to offer the sacrifice, but... If the woman cannot afford a lamb, she shall bring two doves, two pigeons. Now Luke tells us, the Gospel of Luke says, they brought two birds, which means that they were terribly poor. Do you know poverty is such a thing that can make you angry with God? Lord, why did you do this? Why did you allow me to be born in such a poor family? A girl once said to me, brother, I had just two dresses to go to college. Just two dresses. I used to wash and people used to make fun of me. And that is how I got friendly with this boy. 
was very rich. He used to give me dresses, but also he led me in the wrong way. And I often think, why did God allow this? Another said to me, brother, you know, I always wanted to go for fine arts. I qualified, I had the marks, but I didn't have the money, brother. My parents could not afford it, so I could not go at all for that course. And proof of, brother, I always question, why did the Lord allow me to be born in such a family? Or why did the Lord give me the desire to go for fine arts if I could not be able to afford it? Can you see these small things? These small things, disappointments with God can become a major barrier with you crossing the three mala and making it into the arms of God. So she accepted poverty, poverty. You're very poor. How do you accept it? Then because of your money problem, you cannot go abroad. Because of your money problem, you cannot uh, study. Huh? You're given a job and you, and, uh, you cannot progress beyond the job. Huh? Does the Holy Spirit remind you now what you feel? How angry you get? You'll never say, you'll never say by mouth, I'm angry with God. You'll say, praise you, Jesus. But inside the anger remains, isn't it? What's the Holy Spirit saying today, dear friend? He's saying, how can you intimately love Jesus when there's deep-seated disappointment with him? And uh, they carried the child Jesus and they went into the temple where they met a man called Simeon. Simeon. The Holy Scriptures describe Simeon as a good man, a very holy man, a good man, a very holy man. At that time, there was a man named Simeon living in Jerusalem. He was a good man, God-fearing man was waiting for Israel to be saved. The Holy Spirit was with him. Wow, look at the description. Four things. Very good man, very holy man. And he took the child into his arms. And he started saying wonderful things about the child. He gave thanks to God. And then he said, this child will do great things. And the child's father and mother were amazed. You know what happens? When someone takes your child and starts saying, this child will do great things. You know what happens to the parents? Their mouth and the jaw drops. Oh my God, he's talking such lovely things. The child's father and mother were amazed at the things Simeon said. And then Simeon dropped a bomb. He said, because of this child, a sword will cross your heart, you don't marry. Today, if you ponder, just imagine someone coming to your house for the baptism of your child. And at that function, the child, the child, your child is taken to the arms by that man. And that man says, you know, this child is going to bring a lot of bad luck to this house. What would you feel? Wouldn't you think, what a man, he doesn't have even manners. Huh? And the way he talks, and he's a holy man, filled with God's spirit. This is the kind of behavior, this is the kind of talk you should have. Wouldn't these thoughts come to you? Wouldn't this thought come at least because of a good day like baptism day? Just shut your mouth. No, don't talk these things. You can tell us some other time. Hasn't this crossed your mind? Sometimes. So many of you all are in contact with holy people. They may be leaders of your group, spiritual guides, etc. People filled with the Holy Spirit, but sometime or the other, you're hurt by them. Doesn't this thought spring to your mind? They are holy people. They should talk like this. He's a man filled with the spirit. I had a man who said to me, brother, I've never entered the church. I said, why? He says, that parish priest which I was, he's known to be very renewed and very charismatic. But he said and announced from the stage, from the altar, those who are standing at the door, please come in. He says, I admit I was standing at the door, brother. But then the father repeated, he says, those who are standing for mass at the door, please come in, otherwise go out. Is this the way to talk? Brother, you tell me, I left the church that day and I never have gone back. So can you see instances like this? Huh? And someone may come to you and say to you, you know, I don't, I have left that prayer group. Huh? Because I don't like the leader, the way he, he behaves, etc, etc. No? Once someone came to me and said, brother, I've decided to work with your group. Take us, take me wherever you want, etc. I've left that prayer group because that leader was like this, like and I said to him, you better go back because I'm worse than that leader. You understand, no? The injury is put on you by holy people, by spiritual people, people who should have not, you should not have expected them to behave like that, but they did it, they said it. 
and your picture. If you want to come to learn about forgiveness, come to Mary. She is the symbol of every, everything. She is the symbol of the girl who cannot get properly married. The girl who dreams about marriage but could not marry. She is the symbol of the widow. For her husband, Joseph, died. She is the symbol of the lonely woman because later even her son was not there at home. She was all alone. She is the symbol of the childless because she brought forth Jesus but she had no other children of her own. There was, it was God's plan to be like that. So she symbolizes all these. Come to Mary. Learn from Mary about the fullness of Jesus. Learn from Mary about how Jesus, how she who was full of grace, learned from Jesus to proclaim to others, learn from Jesus. At one stage, even her own son, she had gone, you know, to that incident to call him to eat. And she said, they sent him a message, Jesus, your mother is calling you. And that sentence was turned over and misinterpreted by many. Till today it's being misinterpreted by many. And Jesus said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Can you see the humiliation? And the people would talk like that. And today in great measure, even till today, she's being humbled. But she learned one lesson from Jesus. Jesus had been humbled also. Though he was in the form of God, St. Paul writes to the Philippians, yet he did not consider himself God, but he lowered himself. That is it, my dear friend. Listen carefully. Learn to settle always for things which are far less due to you. Learn to settle always for things which are far less due to you. And learn to do this without any bitterness. That person did not give me importance. That person did not talk this way to me. That person should have said all these things to me. I'm the leader of the group. Learn to settle for things which are far less than due to you and learn to settle without any bitterness. This was the example she learned from Jesus because Jesus settled for things far less due to him. Settle. And she came to remind us, do what he tells you to do. And at the cross was the worst. May no mother go through what she went through at the cross with her son wriggling there like a, practically a worm and people spitting at him and making all comments. Really, may no mother go through it. But even that could not break her because she knew God will show her why this had to happen and how this is for her good. Can you allow that shell of your heart to be scraped by the Holy Spirit so that to make way for the pure milk of the love of God and be filled with the love of God so that the tenderness of Jesus removes all the ugliness removes all the areas which I thought I had forgiven, I had given up, but it was still lurking there in my heart. Jesus, I surrender myself to you. 